our colloqu this is colloquia. So today's speaker will be Professor Clemens Beckinger, and it's a real pleasure to have, it, to have him here. So just to give you a bit introduction about his life, he did his PhD in Constance in Germany, then he moved uh, for a postdoc in the US, in uh, Denver, Colorado. Then he came back to uh, Constance again, where he did his habilitation. And after that, he uh, has been professor in Stuttgart since 10 years ago. In the last uh, five years, he has also been associated as fellow to the Max Planck Society, into the, so associated with the Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems in Stuttgart also. His interest uh, range are quite broad, actually comes from uh, condensed matter physics, experimental condensed matter physics, which is very close to what we do at Bilkent, most of us at least. And uh, then he moved uh, towards the soft matter, optical tracers, uh, things that are very similar to what we do. And uh, today he will speak to us about uh, friction at the nanoscale. I have one. Oh. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. <laughs> also for the hospitality. So I, this program was best organized. Actually, I'm doing so many trips, but this was a perfectly organized uh, uh, thing here. Also, thanks to all those people I already um, talked to. Thanks for the time showing me your labs. Okay, so you might wonder what that actually is, but this picture actually describes very well what I'm going to talk about. This was taken at the occasion of a... You can hear me, right? So I have here so many cables. You Can you hear me? Yeah? Okay, good. So this was taken at the occasion of a truck puller competition, and obviously it's the task is to pull a truck just with the, with the power of your body across a certain distance. And obviously, as you can see here, this seems to be not that easy. And the reason for that is because there is friction between the wheels and the street. And that's essentially what I'm going to talk about. I will talk about friction. And also, friction is a, a common day an everyday uh, a thing we realize, you will be surprised to hear that friction is only partially understood, in particular when it comes to small length scales. There are many open issues, and I will talk about a part of them. So um, most of you have a kind of negative feelings when talking and thinking about friction, because friction is usually related to energy losses or wear. So if you scratch, you remove part of the surface. Um, you can deform things, you can even destroy things because friction can also lead to cracks which then propagate across the entire device. And that's, that's the reason why people often try to minimize the friction. They want to reduce friction as much as possible uh, because friction is wasting quite some amount of our gross national product. So that's a typical number. I'm sure similar numbers would also apply for Turkey. That's a number which applies to the, to the US. Um, but you must not forget there are at least as many situations where you do not want to minimize friction, but where you rather are interested in increasing the friction. For example, if you play violin, this wouldn't even work without friction. You could not even walk because there is no grip between your shoes and the, and, and the, and the, uh, the streets if there would be no friction. So the actual point about friction is uh, you want to control it. So depending on the need, depending on the specific uh, situation, you want to have either high friction or small friction. OK, so let me just give you an outline of my talk here. I will very briefly uh, tell you about the first attempts to, to do systematic experiments on friction. And then I will show you. Um, how we actually address that problem, and we have a kind of an unusual approach. We will mimic atomic frictional processes by using micron-sized colloidal particles similar to those which are used also in a group of Professor Wolpe, and we will slide them across the surface, but strange enough, this surface is not an atomic surface. This surface is made out of light. It's a light-induced substrate, and you will see why we are doing that. And what I will then show you is that we observe uh, so-called kinks and anti-kinks. You will learn what that is uh, in some, some minutes. These are topological solitons which have been predicted to be responsible for friction. And you will see them here for the first time in, in, in real space. And if we have enough time, I also will, at the end of my talk, capture or uh, say a couple of words about friction on 
not periodic surfaces. This all relates here to periodic surfaces, but what happens on quasi-periodic surfaces. OK, now, you, I'm sure many of you know this. This is uh, taken from one of the textbooks of Leonardo da Vinci. He was actually the first doing systematic experiments on friction. And this is essentially a setup which is even used nowadays. I'm sure you also have seen that in your first year of physics. So you have a block of wood. And then you have here a rope. And you might here add a weight, which is then accelerating that. It's applying a force. And then you, for example, can measure the force you need to make this body move. OK, that is then the, the, the static friction force. And uh, uh, Leonardo da Vinci was actually the first doing this type of experiments. And he found here three important kind of laws. He didn't explain that, but he was the first to figure out how friction actually, what's, what we know about friction. The first thing is very obvious. I mean, he said, well, if I double the weight, if I double the load, the force acting perpendicular to the sliding plane, then of course the friction force doubles. I mean, that's something you always, you all have, would have guessed. Yeah, the next point is way less obvious, what he also realized, and that is what you nicely see here, it does not matter whether you slide this block of wood here in that position or whether you put it upright or whether you put it to the side. It does not matter what is actually the geometric contact area. The friction force is always the same. That's, that's quite surprising, I think, right? And the third law is, or the third observation is, that the friction force is pretty much independent of the velocity. Well, and these findings have been uh, quite some time later, cast it into a simple equation. You know that this is this Aventon's Coulomb law, which simply says that the friction force is identical to a friction coefficient mu, which depends on the properties of the surface, on the surface roughness, times the load. Okay? Now let's go back to this second observation. Why the friction is independent of the areas in contact? And you see it took quite some time, a couple of hundred years, until this has been explained. Actually, this goes back to Bowden and Tabor, who realized that if you have two blocks of material and put them on top of each other, um, you can define a geometrical or an apparent uh, uh, contact area. But of course, you know that this is not the true contact area, because if you zoom in, these surfaces are not atomically smooth. Two surfaces always touch only locally, and these points where they touch, this is called, I hope you can, can see that, uh, this, uh, red on bluish might be not the best contrast, these are called asperities. And it's actually the contact areas formed by the asperities which define the real contact area. And this can be much smaller, it can be just a fraction of a percent of the apparent contact area. OK, but that does not explain, actually, why the friction is independent of the apparent area. The point is now that if you apply a force, if you apply a load, then these contacts here become elastically or plastically deformed. And this now leads to the fact, if I go back here to the first slide, in that situation, the pressure, we have more of these asperities compared to that situation, but the pressure force divided by area is here much smaller than here. And this eventually leads then to this independence of the, of, uh, of the friction force from the area. And that this concept of this asperities actually is true has been recently probed in an experiment where people were using two pieces of, of plexiglass, of PMMA, which is transparent, so centimeter-sized plexiglass blocks. And they were sliding them across of each other. And from below, you would have a, an incident laser beam whose incident angle is slightly above the critical angle. So you have your total internal reflection. All the intensity is reflected here, but only um, when, or actually at those positions where the two surfaces meet each other at these points of the asperities, the laser beam just propagates straight through. So simply by measuring the intensity here, you can you have a measure of the um, real contact area. And what these people did here, they, you see here is the uh, intensity, the transmitted intensity, so the, the contact area here as a function of the normal force. You see this is pretty much 
a, a straight line, which means that the real contact uh, area is proportional to the load. Here, this is the transmitted intensity as a function of the friction force. We also have a straight relationship which uh, indicates that the real contact area is proportional to friction. And if you combine that, you immediately see that the load is proportional to the friction, and you end up again at, at this uh, Aventon uh, Coulomb's law. So I would say, at least at these macroscopic length scales, friction is something which is understood. So let's, now let's go to very small length scales. Let's now go to a single point contact. And this is what you, what you see here. And experimentally, this is most easily realized by having a tip of an AFM cantilever, right? And you scan it across a surface. And if there is friction, this cantilever will be a little bit tilted and you can measure that by an optical uh, device and from that you can directly measure the, uh, the lateral friction force here as a function of the displacement. And what you typically see is that in that situation the tip wouldn't move in a steady state, right? So you don't have a steady motion. Rather than that, you have a so-called stick-slip motion. You see that it's, it's, it's resting there for some time, and then it's slipping, then it's resting there for some time and slipping. And this is exactly what you see here. And this can be mimicked very simply by a mechanical toy model where you replace the tip with a bead, okay? This bead is hooked up with a spring to a bar. And so there is an elastic interaction. So this mimics more or less this device here, okay? You, you, you move the bar to the side, which corresponds to the scanning, to the, to the piezo drive of the AFM cantilever. And in order to mimic the interaction between the tip and the surface, you simply apply a zonizoidal function because you assume that the substrate is composed, <coughs> sorry, is composed of, a, of a crystal, okay? And if you do that, this leads to such a, a motion uh, equation of motion. This is a Langevin equation. And if you solve that, you find exactly this type of motion here, um, which is exactly the same as you observe in the experiment. So within that model here, you can also reasonably mimic or explain um, a friction. OK. now. And that's actually what I will talk about. We will not talk about friction at very large scales. We will nor, nor talk about friction, neither talk about friction at, at, at a point contact scale. Often, in particular, if you go to nano devices, you don't have a point contact, but let's say you have more than a single atom. Let's say you have a, an area of 20 by 20 atoms like that. And this is now, uh, actually, I should mention, this is the so-called Tomlinson model. You see, it's quite old. And the situation, if you now add more atoms, and that's what I do here, this is the so-called frankel kontorova model. You see, the models are quite old. And in order, so each of these atoms now, again, interacts with the subspace potential, which is a sine curve. And in addition, of course, there's also interaction between neighboring atoms. And this is simply uh, considered by adding springs here. And now comes the point, you immediately see that by adding more than a single particle here, by adding more particles, we have two length scales in the system. We have the periodicity of the substrate, AS, and we have here the periodicity, this will be eventually our colloidal layer, but this will be the second body, that's the periodicity AC. And it depends now very much on how these numbers are related to each other. And in, this is what defines the commensurability, right? So if this is an integer ratio, this is commensurate. But if this is a, a non-integer, in particular if AC over ES is an irrational number, then this model predicts that the friction actually should completely disappear. And this is what people call super lubricity. And in fact, this has been also found in experiments. Here, this is... Um, <coughs> for um, a graphite surface. You have a graphite surface. And once you start to scan with an AFM to, 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 uh, to uh, image graphite, often it happens that a small flake of graphite is removed from the substrate and then attaches to the AFM tip. And then what you then do, you do no longer scan with a tip, 
over the graphite surface, but you scan a flake of graphite, in that case it's about 100 atoms uh, over a graphite surface. And what you see now is the friction coefficient of this during scanning as a function of the rotation angle. You can either scan the flake in that direction or scan it in that direction. And what you see is for certain directions at zero degrees and 60 degrees, this just corresponds to the rotational symmetry of graphite. We have a very high friction coefficient, but in between it essentially gets to zero and there is a simple classic or a mechanical analog, and this is what, what you see here. Um, this just shows you here, these two layers are actually in registry. This is a commensurate situation, and here the friction is quite large. But if you tilt one of the bodies with respect to the substrate, you get out of registry, and this then is responsible for this superlubricity, which is one of the predictions within this frankel kontorova model. Now, this model is doing more. Uh, actually, it's, it's also it, it's, it's predicting more. And this is what I want to show you here. Once more, we have here particles connected via springs. They are located in a sinusoidal potential. For simplicity, this is one dimensional. Okay, And now you can ask yourself, what happens if you apply a force to the right? How these particles would move? Because, I mean, friction is essentially uh, the question how particles uh, how you can, so to say, two bodies, uh, how do you describe two bodies in relative motion, right? So naively you might say, well, if I pull sufficiently strong, all the particles, all the same, might jump across this potential barrier. Well, but that's not what happens. What actually happens is that due to thermal fluctuations, it will happen that here and there, two particles <laughs> occupy the same potential well. And what you see from that now, if you apply a force, these particles, because they repel each other, right? This particle here is already shifted up. So this particle here has the smallest effective uh, potential barrier to, to overcome. So the mobility, in other words, the mobility of this particle is highest. And if you apply a force, uh, this so-called kink here, this is a kink, this will jump. So this particle will jump from here to here, right? And then we have here two particles in a potential well, and then the kink will uh, jump uh, again from, from the left to the right, and so it will propagate through that system. And this kink here, this is within this frankel kontorova model, very important because this is the most efficient mechanism how relative mass transport can occur within, that, uh, within such a system. Okay, now um, I mentioned already to you, um, we are not going to do experiments on an atomic scale. We are actually doing experiments on a, on a micron scale. And for that purpose, we will replace the atoms here, these red balls here, with colloidal particles. I'm, I'm not going to talk about colloids in general. These are just spherical particles. In our case, these are silica particles. It could be also polystyrene particles. And they are immersed in water. Don't, don't worry about the water. And the more important point is how we create then the substrate potential. And that is done by using uh, light fields. And uh, since I'm not sure whether everybody here is familiar with this concept of, of um, actually how to exert forces onto particles with optical light fields. This is called an optical tweezer. Let me just add you two slides for that. The concept has been introduced by Arthur Ashkin. And the idea is very simple. If you have a particle with a certain dielectric constant, and this is larger than that of the solvent, and you get it, and you have a focused laser beam, this particle will be sucked in into the laser beam. And this is uh, what you see here. You see here one of these laser foci, right? You have here three particles. And just watch what happens if that particle gets close to that um, laser focus. Ah, OK, I can start it with this remote control. <coughs> Here you see the brown emotion, and choop, all of a sudden, it's becoming sucked in. So you see there's a strong force while those simply fluctuate. And, and Giovanni Volpe, Professor Volpe, he is really one of the world leading experts in that field. He has contributed a lot to the understanding of these um, optical forces. Here we just uh, will take advantage of the effect, and I will not go into much more details.
Okay, now the question is, what we want to do is we want to mimic such a two-dimensional subspace potential with optical forces, and of course a simple, uh, a simple laser focus is not sufficient for that. In order to create an extended uh, light lattice, you have to interfere lasers. And of course, you all know, if you interfere two laser beams, you get such a periodic stripe pattern. If you interfere three laser beams, you get something like a 1-1-1 one, one, one surface. This is interference of five laser beams, which leads to a 1-0-0 oh, oh surface. And we also did, and I'm coming back to that at the end of my talk, we also did experiments with quasi-crystals, and you can create also quasi-periodic light fields by interfering um, five laser beams. So that's essentially the way we, we, we create this uh, light, uh, this, this substrate potentials. And the advantage here is you can, by variation of the tilti tilting angle, you can easily adjust the length scale of periodicity, right? Okay, if you want to make the periodicity larger, simply open up this cone here. Um, and if you want to, you can also play around with the, with the strengths of the substrate, so the potential depth, and this is proportional to the intensity of the four or three or whatsoever uh, laser beams. So we have a large flexibility. You can even in situ change the parameters of your subspace potential, and this is actually very important. Okay, that's now how we typically um, uh, perform an experiments. We start with a colloidal suspension, so these are silica spheres immersed in water where they normally undergo Brownian motion. So they fluctuate, as this would be also true for an atom at finite temperature on any, on any surface. Diameter of these particles is on the order of a micron, one and a half microns. Um, then we tune their interaction, right? We have to, we can adjust how they interact. And this is in that case, uh, these particles have surface charges and we can um, we can, uh, so to say, tune how strong these charges couple uh, by adding salt into the suspension. So this is, we can control it very precisely. Well, we also have to control the mean distance between the particles, and this is done by another optical tweezer, and I also show you that concept here. Um, this is actually very schematic, a part of the experiment. This is the sample cell. And we have here another laser beam, which is focused from below into the sample cell. And it's reflected here at two mirrors. And these mirrors are driven by a computer. And if you do it right, you can, for example, have a circle or a square. And this, of course, also acts as an optical teaser. And very rapidly, you see that this contour is filled with colloidal particles. Now comes the point, I mean, this is, provides something like a, like a fence, like a barrier, okay? Particles from the inside cannot go outside and vice versa. And if you now simply play around with the contour, so these mirrors are operated by a computer program, you can compress the system or you can expand it, okay? And by doing so, you can very precisely adjust the uh, particle density. That's what we do in that step. Well, and it's not done yet, it's not over yet. Um, in particular, if you compress the system very much, uh, the particles and, and everything happens, works very close to a substrate. This is our substrate, which is also negatively charged. Um, of course, the particles always would like to, uh, to escape in, into, the, in, into the vertical direction, right? They want to pop up. And in order to avoid that, we have another laser beam which is coming from above, which is an expanded laser beam, an infrared laser beam, which is acting via light forces, which is pushing the particles down. It's using the photonic pressure to keep the particles localized at that surface. Well, and once we have done that, we have created a colloidal monolayer, right? A crystalline monolayer, and now we can create this substrate potential, which is then also projected inside the cell. Well, and the only thing I didn't tell you yet is how to apply now the force. I mean, during a friction experiment, we have now to apply a force to that colloidal monolayer across that substrate. And this is actually very simple. We tried different things. You could, for example, also shift the interference pattern by, by changing the phases, the relative phases between the laser beams. We have 
done something which is much more simple. We simply move the entire sample cell, we shift it in that direction, and while doing so, we exert on each particle just the Stokes force. So the Stokes force acting on each particle is 6 p atoms of viscosity particle uh, radius times the velocity of this sample stage. And simply by changing the velocity of this, of this, of this sample cell, which is mounted on a piezo stage, we can continuously vary the force. That's the way um, how we do that. OK, now. OK, so we move that to the side with a certain velocity. And from that velocity, velocity we can immediately derive um, the force. Um, well, I might skip that here and go immediately to the first um, experiment. So this is our substrate potential. And this is our uh, colloidal crystal. They, they repel each other. That's the reason why they form a crystal. And I will start with commensurate conditions. If you remember, commensurate was just a condition where the lattice lengths here of the colloidal system and the substrate is identical. <coughs> and what you see here is the mean particle velocity. We can follow the particle with a microscope, can identify the particle positions, can average over the velocities. And this is the mean particle velocity, which is plotted along this direction as a function of the pulling force. And 1 over the mean particle velocity is something proportional to the friction, right? If the particle velocity is very high, obviously the friction is very small and vice versa. And this is what we usually obtain here. First, the velocity is 0, and then it starts to increase. How do we understand that? Well, I just show you here a couple of trajectories. At small pulling forces, we are in the so-called pin state. This is very easy to understand, because if you only pull a little bit, the particles, which are all residing in these potential wells, would not escape, right? You have to apply a certain, if you are below a certain force, they simply prefer to stay in their potential wells. And that's where the mean particle velocity is zero. And you see that these are the trajectories of the particles. They simply remain localized inside these potential wells. Then. There is an intermediate regime. You see at some point here, obviously, the monolayer starts to move. But here, it's more interesting than that, because you see still a part of the particles are still stuck, while another part of the sample actually moves. This is the so-called depinning transition. And I will come back to that. And <clears throat> if you, of course, apply a very strong force in that regime here, then all the particles move with the very same velocity. This is, again, very obvious, because if the force is sufficiently strong, you pull the entire monolayer with you, right? That's no big deal. Well, we can do more than that. We can also look at the particle velocity. So here, as a function of the applied pulling force, you see here the particle velocities. In dark, you see fast particles. In bright, you see slow particles. And the first thing you realize is, that fast particles seem to, to group in, in, into, into islands, right? And if you increase the force, the, even these islands start to grow in the vertical direction, and they form bands. <clears throat> That's the first thing we realize. The second thing is we can also, simply by uh, image analysis, we can calculate from the Voronoi cell area. If you don't know what that is, don't, don't worry. But we can calculate how compressed our system is locally. And lattice compressions are labeled in, uh, in, in dark. So this is where the next neighbor distances between colloids are a little bit shorter than the average. And, and other regions are labeled in bright. And what you immediately see is that obviously fast particles, you see essentially the same structure here and here. <coughs> you see this here occurs here, this here, this here. Also these band structures occur. <laughs> and what you see is that fast particles, obviously, are located at lattice compressions. And if you remember, oh, actually, that is uh, a movie here. Here you see the particle velocities. Here you see the compression zone. And you see, if you apply a force, they move both through the sample. And here is another movie where you see at high pulling forces where these bands, uh, bands have developed. But you also see that these structures, these regions where fast particles group together, 
remain pretty intact regarding their shape. There's hardly any dispersion, and you also see they move in the direction of F. F is always applied from the left to the right, and if you remember what I, what I showed you before, or what I explained to you before, this is exactly what you would expect from a king. So this is the same picture of a king I showed you before, <coughs> and I, show, I told you before that a king um, uh, always occurs at a local lattice compression, right? And because this particle has the highest mobility, it's clear that the fastest particle, because this is the particle which is fast, because all the others remain located, this is making a jump. This, the fast particles are located at lattice um, compression. And you also see uh, first this particle jumps, then this particle jumps. You also see that the fast regions of fast particles always move along the applied force. Well, the same model also predicts so-called anti-kinks. This is what you see here. If you have fewer particles than potential wells, and this can be achieved by changing by, by going away from commensurate conditions, you see that not all the potential wells are occupied, right? And then you have a situation like that. There's always repulsion between the particles. So this particle here is, so to say, pushed up energetically. And if you apply a force, this particle will jump first. And you see the particle which will jump first is now not located at a lattice compression, but at a lattice expansion. And if you consider what will happen then? Okay, first this particle will jump, and the next particle will jump is this here, and then this here, and then this here. So the prediction is that an anti-kink should occur at where the lattice is locally dilated, okay? And we would expect that regions of fast particles should actually move opposite to the force. That's a signature of an anti-kink. Well, and this can be also seen in experiments. All we have to do is now to detune the lattice constants, here we have now the lattice constant of the substrate is now smaller than that of the colloidal monolayer. And here I show you uh, the corresponding pictures um, I showed you um, before. And um, might be the first thing you realize that the fast particles here occur at this domain walls. This domain wall, that's also something which is well known from surface science if you have a substrate and grow a monolayer under non-commensurate conditions, you have, a you have a certain strain between the adsorbate and the substrate. This leads to domain walls. And of course, it's not surprising that the fast particles originate at the domain walls because at the domain wall, the particle, the adsorbate, is missing a layer or of, of potential wells or a line of potential wells of the substrate. So you see here, this white region, these are the places where no particles are. Obviously, the, here they have a lot of space, the colloidal particles, and that's therefore pretty obvious that these are the places where they can first uh, speed up. And then you see if we increase the force, then we again form the bands. Here we have the corresponding uh, Voronoi cell area. But if you now, for example, compare here the fast particles with the corresponding color code of the Voronoi compression, a Voronoi cell area, you see now this corresponds to the bright areas, which indeed means that the fast particles are now at the lattice expansions, okay? And just to convince you that these are indeed our kinks, okay? I told you fast particles originate at the main walls. I'll just show you a movie. And here indeed you see, again we pull to the right, but Regions of fast particles move to the left. That's exactly the signature I was talking about. So this is clear evidence for anti-kinks. Here, <clears throat> this is again the comparison mean particle velocity as a function of the driving force. Open symbols was commensurate. The red symbols are now incommensurate. And because we have many more fast particles, because we have here these domain walls, and you see also the periodicity uh, the, the distance between the bands is much higher than that under commensurate conditions. That's a reason why here the friction coefficient is smaller or the velocity is much higher than that in, uh, uh, in, in commensurate conditions. So we can go a little bit further. We can make things more quantitative. And for that, I show you here once more a couple of snapshots 
for commensurate situation. So this was the first example I showed you. And here you see <coughs> such a kink, how it's progressing from the left to the right as a function of time. And we are now interested in understanding how the colloidal particles actually would move while a kink is moving here across the particles. And exemplarily, I show you that for this chain of particles. Here you see that chain. Here we have on the left side, we have a red particle. And here you see its trajectory, how the x coordinate changes as a function of time. This is for the leftmost particle, and blue is for the rightmost particle. And what you see is while this kink is moving across this chain, each particle here is simply making a jump by one lattice side. It's just one AS. So first this particle is moving, then the second particle, then the third, and so on, and the fourth. So it's, it's a consecutive motion, right? One after the particle just makes a jump by one lattice side. OK, and from that we can now calculate very easily the interaction time between a kink and a single particle. So this time t is just the width of the kink. So a particle interacts with the kink until the entire kink with its own width have moved across a particle. And this is just L times AS in units of the subspace lattice set, uh, 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 periodicity. This is L times AS divided by the kink velocity, right? A length scale divided by a time gives you, by a velocity gives you a time. And this, you have to divide it by the kink. Uh -huh, might be, I should go here. This is kink width divided by the kink velocity. Well, and we said at the same time, a single particle, uh, this is LA divided by V kink, and at the same time, the partic each particle makes a jump by a single lattice side and uh, the velocity is the hopping time of a single particle, which is just taken um, from, from that slope here. What that actually means, and that's it's then probably more simple than this equation here, is that the kink, the kink velocity is L times faster, L its width, compared to the hopping velocity of a single particle, which is not surprising because while the kink has to move over its own width, so L time AS, each particle just makes a jump by a single lattice side, right? That is uh, what I wanted to show you here. And with that, we can now go on. And um, what you see here is the velocity of finding a, cer a probability of finding a certain velocity of the particles. Again, all the particles which are not inside a kink, they don't move, right? This is the reason why we find here a very high peak at zero velocity. And these are just the particles which are inside a kink. So the idea is, in a simplified picture, we have only static particles and particles which are inside a kink, or where just a kink is running over the particles, and they move with a hopping velocity. And within a one-dimensional model, then you can simply say, well, the mean particle velocity is just given by the hopping velocity, right, times the number of particles inside a kink, which is the number of kinks, times the width of a kink. And then you have to divide everything by the number of all particles in the system. Now, um, using the relation I showed you before, VH time L is the kink velocity, you end up at an expression which only now depends on the kink properties, right? The mean particle velocity, which I showed you, is inverse to the friction coefficient now only depends on properties which are related to the kink, the kink velocity and the number of kinks. And this, I think, demonstrates to you how important actually the kinks are. And just to show you how well that works, um, we have here measured the kink number, the kink velocity. We can deduce that directly from, from, directly from experiments. Then we calculate that expression here. And this can be compared to the independently measured mean particle velocity. And you see this nicely compares both for commensurate but also for incommensurate conditions. And I think that's really clear evidence how important kinks are actually um, for friction. Okay, now I have another five minutes. Uh, I'm just looking to money. Is that? Okay, that's great. Um, and within 
the last couple of minutes, I would also tell you a little bit of friction on quasi-periodic surfaces. You all know that last year the Nobel Prize of Chemistry was given to Daniel Schechtman for the discovery of the quasi-crystals. And to appreciate why he uh, received the Nobel Prize, um, <clears throat> I just want to remind you that over, over many hundreds of years, probably thousands of years, people believed that all crystals, all periodic organized, or all crystals, right, have certain types of rotational symmetry. Crystals can only have a two, three, four, or six-fold rotational symmetry. And the reason for that is actually quite simple, because if you think in, in terms of tiles, only if you have tiles with that rotational symmetry, you can cover a plane without leaving gaps. I mean, if you go home at your bathroom, most likely you will not five, find fivefold tiles, because if you start with fivefold tiles, you, you run into a mess, you will create voids, and that's not good for a crystal. And this is general wisdom, right? And now having this in mind, I think you can imagine the surprise of Daniel Schechtman, and he, when he was, he was working at metal alloys, mixtures of metals, was synthesizing them, and was analyzing them with X-ray diffraction. And one day, he received a pattern like that. <coughs> and if you now look here at the number of diffraction peaks, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, this has obviously a tenfold rotational symmetry. This does not belong to one of those classes here, but at the same time, the peaks are sharp. And you all know if I have sharp diffraction peaks, I have a highly ordered material. So obviously this is a crystal, a highly ordered material, which is not a conventional crystal. It's a non-periodic material with long-range, perfect long-range order. And these materials we call nowadays quasi-crystals. <clears throat> There are many groups all over the world working on these materials. We know in the meantime more than, well, I think, 120 different types of materials. And one of the reasons people are very much interested in those is because they have very unusual properties. Here I just mentioned a few of them. And I will here uh, in, a, in, a, in a minute come back to the friction. The friction of quasi crystal is known to be particularly um, small. Um, let me just show you here once more how we create this uh, quasi-crystalline surfaces. All we do is we superimpose five laser beams. <clears throat> and I think you immediately realize that this is not a periodic light intensity. So the color code simply means that red is high laser intensity, which corresponds to a deep substrate potential well, and blue and green are pretty flat areas. Um, also, it's not periodic. You see that certain motifs are found here at different positions. I mean, OK, I skipped that here. But you see here these, these decagons, these so-called flowers. You see it here. You see it here. You see it here. This is the motif with the highest possible local rotational symmetry, which is uh, characterized by a, uh, by a central uh, valley, and then surrounded by a ring of 10 uh, subspace potential wells. In addition to these decagons, you also find here these pentagons, and this pentagon, the side lengths of the pentagon are related by this golden mean, 1.618. This is all the features you, you also know from atomic uh, quasi-crystals, and all those features are also imposed here in such a light-induced quasi-periodic optical potential. I just show you that to convince you that what we do here with five laser beams is as good as if you would have here a true atomic quasi-periodic surface. Um, <clears throat> very briefly, I mean, just to convince you that this is a good model system for an atomic quasi-crystal, um, we were interested in, in how a colloidal crystal would change its structure if we slowly would increase the laser intensity, uh, meaning if we would slowly increase the interaction between the colloids and the quasi-periodic substrate potential. So here the laser intensity is zero, the colloids form a nice crystal. If we crank up the laser intensity, of course, the colloids, so to say, fall into the potential wells provided by the quasi-periodic substrate potential. And then uh, this is a so-called P1 Penrose tiling. You need a different type 
to describe that structure. And here you clearly see that here you have also now 10 diffraction peaks of the colloidal system, which clearly tells you that the colloids here now have adopted a decagonal quasi-periodic order. But the question here we wanted to ask is how a crystal turns into a quasi-crystal. And to our big surprise, um, we found a intermediate phase. This reminded us very much to one of the 11 Archimedean tilings. That's the reason why we also called it an Archimedean-like tiling, which is comprised of bands of quadratic tiles and triangular tiles. And to make a long story short, this phase here, which has been first discovered in a colloidal system, um, is also found in uh, numerical simulations. So this is the particle density. This is the particle substrate interaction. And in that small regions here, this has been also found in numer numerical experiments. But, and I think that's the nicest thing, it also has been afterwards discovered in a system where people deposited a couple of monolayers on copper on an atomic quasi-periodic um, surface. You see here this, this stripe-like faces in different directions. This is exactly corresponds to our Archimedean-like tiling. And these people actually now use our model to describe their data. So I'm just showing that to you to convince you that what we do with light is actually very similar to what people actually do in surface science with atomic, with atomic um, uh, systems. OK, coming back to friction. Now here you see the situation. Again, now we slide here a colloidal crystal across a quasi-periodic substrate. And here I show you one small particle velocity as a function of a force. And you see now this, is the this was commensurate, this was incommensurate, and this is now the quasi-crystal. And the quasi-crystal here, the velocity is even higher. And for comparison here, I show you as a dashed line the smallest possible uh, friction coefficient you can achieve in that system, this would correspond to sliding our colloidal monolayer on a flat surface. And you see um, our quasi-crystal is almost a perfect, um, a perfect surface when it comes to friction. Um, this reduced friction of, on quasi-periodic surfaces um, this is also found in experiments on the atomic scale. I just show you here data from Patricia Thiel. Um, uh, you can, if you cut the quasi-crystal the right way, you can simply by changing the scanning direction, you can pro-periodic and quasi-periodic surfaces. I will not go into details. If you have questions, you can ask me later. <clears throat> but what you see here is this is the friction coefficient. This is the torsional response of this cantilever, which is proportional to the friction, as a function of the scanning angle. And you see if they probe it along the periodic direction, we have a quite high friction. If it probe it along the aperiodic or quasi-periodic direction, the friction coefficient is about one order of magnitude smaller. Now the final question I want to ask is, what about the role of the kings? I was making advertisement that kings are very important to understand friction at nanometer length scales. Um, at the same time, if you remember, for these kings and anti-kings, we always had this concept of a periodic substrate potential. By definition, quasi-crystals are not periodic. So how, how we can resolve that? Well, for that, I show you here um, the particle trajectories while we pull the colloidal crystal across a quasi-periodic uh, substrate in this direction. And what you see is that the particles do no longer simply follow the force. They make here these undulations. They, they make here these wiggles. And if you compare uh, these positions with the underlying substrate potential, so I just highlighted here a couple of positions where these particles make these wiggles here. And if you then look what, how the substrate potential actually is, we see that where this happens, we always have a flower. Okay? We have this flower, this, this local uh, motifs with the highest possible rotational symmetry. And this here is, again, the particle trajectories. And if you now introduce here this angular coordinate, and you have here a potential well, one here, one here, one here, one here, one here. If I plot these energy length uh, potential uh, landscape across this angular 
angle, uh, angular angle phi here, this angle phi, then you see again, at least on a local scale, we have here a periodic substrate potential. So what we claim from that is that the reason why, obviously, also the particles can very rapidly, um, so to say, uh, move here along this direction is simply because they locally find very similar conditions to those I showed you before. Here they f can form kinks and anti-kinks and because we have so many of these flowers in quasi-periodic structures, this might be at least part of the answer. It's certainly not the only answer, but that might be part of the answer why the friction coefficient on quasi-crystalline surfaces um, is that small. Okay, so with that, let me conclude. I could tell you a little bit more, but for the sake of time, I skipped that, and I just want to do two things. I just want to summarize. Um, what is important, whenever you think about friction, make sure that you know about what length scale you're talking about, because the mechanisms of friction very much depend on the length scale. And in particular, on this length scale I was talking about, it are these topological solitons, these kinks and anti-kinks, which dominate the friction in a, in, a, in a quantitative way. Well, as often, if you start with the, with the experiments and we start with this uh, friction thing about, well, a little bit less than three years ago, uh, of course, we have now answered some questions, but actually, in the meantime, way more questions uh, popped up and here are just a couple of, of things we want to investigate. We want to now have small contact areas, want to vary their size, their shape. We, well, we'll also study what happens if you have an oscillating substrate potential which might correspond to the fact that if you pull something you might excite a lattice vibration. Okay, We can also easily induce that in our um, experiments, and we also will look at things like uh, creeping and stuff like that. Well, and last but not least, um, I should also acknowledge the people who were actually doing those uh, experiments. So this also gives you a little bit of flavor about the type of physics we are doing in my group. And Jules Michael, and uh, in particular Thomas Bolein, uh, they were the two people actually responsible for these friction experiments. Jules was actually the first uh, who was working with quasi crystals in my group, and Thomas Bolein is currently, uh, Jules left, he's now working in industry, and Thomas Bolein, he's an extremely talented, I would say really one of my best PhD students, uh, who was doing the friction experiments. He's just currently writing up and will finish probably beginning um, of next year's. Well, and with that, I'd like to conclude and thank you for your attention. Beg your pardon? This interference pattern that you use to get the quasi crystal form uh, these traps is a, is a res result of a linear interaction. So, what would change if you somehow put a nonlinearity into the system? You mean uh, linear interaction, you mean the, the interaction between the colloids and the light field, right? Well, the light field's formation itself first, and then the interaction of the light field with the colloid field. Mm. Probably not completely linear, but. If it's, if it's um, I mean, what enters here is in a simple dipolar system, the interaction is simply given by the number of dipoles integrated over the light distribution, right? That's roughly speaking, in a simple dipolar interaction, what leads then to these potentials. If you would, um, let's say, assume a more complicated or nonlinear, whatever type of interaction, <coughs> actually it is not nonlinear because you do this integral, then uh, certainly only the potential strength would change, right? But the length scales are still set by the length scale given by the substrate potential. 
But the details, how the length, length scale looks in detail, that certainly would be affected if you would assume different types of interactions. We have also done, um, uh, actually in cooperation with a theory group in Dusseldorf, they simply were mimicking, were, were, I mean, actually in these uh, Monte Carlo simulations I showed you, they also assumed just this uh, simple dipolar approximation and you see they obtained similar results. They even could find quantitative agreement with our results. Any other questions? Uh, how about the random surfaces uh, or the light random light surfaces? Is it uh, similar to the classic principle? You mean that what the drag for? If you if you form a random surface like a. a oh, I see. Ah, I see. Okay, got a point. Yeah. Okay. That, okay. That's a good question. Often. Yeah. Right. Okay. So the question is, I discussed periodic surfaces. I discussed quasi-periodic surface. You are asking, what about random surfaces? Well, in random surfaces, the people have studied that, <coughs> and uh, random surfaces are completely different because in random surfaces. Um, there is no period. There is no uh, neither periodicity nor order in general, right? And I showed you what is very important for these quasi crystals is that you have perfect order in the system, right? If you pull a monolayer across, uh, uh, across a randomly random subspace potential, um, things will look completely different. And certainly, I would not assume that kinks or anti kinks play play, play a role here. Yeah. Uh, kings and anti-kings should form pairwise. Right, absolutely true. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, if you are, I mean, it's only true if you are under perfect commensurate conditions. That's absolutely right. Then you would expect that kings and anti-kings form pairwise. Whenever you have one particle which is jumping into another well, that means there is an empty well, right? So in our case, actually, um, we were also expecting that for when we adjusted commensurate conditions, I only showed you the kings and actually predominantly we have formed kings, which simply means that we have not perfect commensurate conditions. This is quite difficult because uh, if you have small, if you don't have a very rigid boundary, right, then the particle, um, the, the, the typical particle distance can change a little bit. In particular, if you then apply a pulling force, um, particles can accumulate a little bit on one side, which certainly leads to small distortions. So in our situations, we could only form situations where we have an excess of anti-kinks or we have a dominance um, of kinks. Of course, if you now would very carefully tune all these parameters, we should eventually end up at the situations, and there you are absolutely right, where we have the same number of kinks and anti-kinks. Yeah. Uh, however, both lead to a reduction of friction. I hope that became clear, right? Right. 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 Yes. Yes. Right. Once a particle gets close to the barrier, it should be all absorbed by the by the barrier. barrier. Right. Yes. How, yeah. How you provide that the part number of particles inside the inside that square does not reduce? You mean while we're pulling the during the pulling experiment or? No, just while they are steady. Some particles are getting. Yeah, but see, after some time, after some time, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, after some time, so let me just make sure whether I, sorry for that. It is only hours from now. Here we go. Um, so, I mean, of course, at the beginning, particles are sucked in into this fence, right? Yes. But once this is filled, it's filled, then it's, then it's, then it's a steady state, right? Yes. 
at some point is, well, I mean, this is just a geometrical point, so you cannot, this is essentially a one-dimensional trap, right? Once you have filled them, it's filled, and you cannot put more inside them. And then the number of particles inside that area is constant, right? But of course, you have to wait until this process. But see, this happens so rapidly. This is, I even have a movie, I, I have, would have to look for it. If you turn that on, it takes five seconds, and then these are strong forces, yeah. Again, can you repeat it? Can you apply this technique to transfer any solid matter? To atomic systems, you mean, yes. right? Okay. No, that certainly would not work because, uh, I mean, the concept of, uh, I mean, first of all, uh, typical forces, typical optical forces are on a range of a couple of hundred femtonewtons up to, well, uh, a tenth or one piconewton, right? If you have a solid, this is not sufficient to make things move, right? That's the reason, actually, why the system are often referred to as soft matter, because the interaction between the particles uh, is also the response of, of these colloidal systems to external fields is much higher than that of a solid. Uh, one, one example, actually, uh, where you can easily see that, if you have here uh, a block of, of, of uh, silicon, right? And if you shake it, it will remain a solid, right? If you have a colloidal crystal and you would shake it, it would melt. And this tells you already that these systems are extremely susceptible to external fields. Therefore, no, the, question, the answer to your first question is no, it could not apply it to a solid. Can we find uh, more efficient surface to uh, different matters in all conditions to try to produce this technique more useful? Uh, I'm not sure whether I got your question. You mean with respect to friction, or you mean we efficient? We utilize this technique in a uh, matter to transfer it, and can uh, make can make a uh, good uh, efficient surface to utilize this to transfer this in all uh, condition for all matter. For example, uh, be transfer a ship on uh, sea and make this uh, ship's uh, surface. Aha, uh -huh, I see. Okay, I got your point. Okay. Okay. Okay, so the question is actually what do we learn from it, right? How can we... Okay, okay. So I think, okay, that's a good question. Um, I mean, what, you, what we learn from that is that if you are able to induce kinks or anti-kinks, right, that's what I showed you, this reduces friction. And uh, since kinks and anti-kinks come together with uh, particle, uh, so to say, um, to regions where particles are e either compressed or expanded, right, um, all situations which can, so to say, promote that would be welcome. So if you have a surface where particles easily can, so to say, come a little bit grouped together or go a little bit further away, roughly speaking, I would assume that this is good in favor of sliding, right? How this immediately translates, if you now ask me, okay, now exactly what surface, uh, how I should design the, the, the surface of a, whatever, of a, of, a, of, a, of a tire in order to reduce the friction, I, I cannot answer that. I cannot answer that. Perfect. So we can continue the discussion outside. There will be something. And uh, let's thank our speaker, Professor Prince Lake Gilman.